Well, today is finally come. It's good to be with you. It's good to be here. And uh, we are thankful as a family. What a great time for a new start on Easter Sunday. And a lot of colleagues said, have said, your first Sunday is going to be Easter Sunday? Wow, that's uh, pretty brave. But what not a better Sunday? Uh, it's a resurrection. It's a new beginning for humanity through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a new beginning for King's Highway. And it's a new beginning for my family. We are excited to be here to celebrate this new beginning. I'm going to start. I have a, a question for you this morning. Is this a Bible believing church? Yes. Yeah. He, he was in first service, so he knows I'm looking for a answer. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not a quiet staring contest. Is this a Bible believing church? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. There we go. Then, then I, I'm not going to tell you this morning about what you already know. Uh, I assume most of you, you know, if you've been a Christian your whole life, or new to Christianity, or if you just come on Easter and Christmas, you know about today, right? You know this is Easter Sunday, uh, you know what happens on today, so what I want to do this morning is, is I don't want to tell you about what you know. I, I want to tell you about what you know. Now what you know is found in all four Gospels. What's your favorite gospel? Give me a favorite gospel. John. John. Okay, John. I like John too. That's great. So I want to hear John. This, and you already know this, right? I'm not reading anything new. In John chapter 20, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the stripes and the strips of linen lying there, but didn't go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. Uh, the cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Now, we also know that there's a resurrection story in Matthew, right? In Mark and Luke. And, and you've heard those. Everybody's heard them. Everybody's read them, I'm sure, right? I'm going to have to, we're going to have to coordinate. Give me the, my, my title screen. I'm going to, I'm going to get a clicker. Uh, I said I'm not here to tell you what you already know. And what you already know is the resurrection stories. But I'm here to tell you this morning about what you don't know. And what you don't know is That it's true. Now, I know you're probably saying, great, we got this new preacher that doesn't know what he's talking about. I just asked if you were a Bible-believing church and if you knew these scriptures and you said, yes, you were. You've heard them your whole life. You're probably sitting there saying, yeah, I know it's true. But I want to tell you this. In almost 30 years of ministry, I've done a lot of funerals. I've been in a lot of hospice patient rooms with someone dying. I've been with those who are sick and not sure if they're going to live or die. And I always ask a question. I ask the question, do you know what's going to happen to you when you die? And of course, I remember watching Richard Dawson do The Family Feud. I loved watching The Family Feud then. I remember that show. I it's still on. I always wanted this to be a question. Because the number one answer that I get when I sit at a bedside and I ask somebody if they know what's going to happen when they die, the number one answer is it's on the board. I hope so. I hear that more than anything else. When I ask somebody if they know what's going to happen when they die. And you know, 
If your answer is, I hope so, that means there's doubt. That, that means there's questions. Hope so means I don't believe what God says. I have doubts. My, my heart's not at peace in accepting the gospel and the resurrection. And I understand you have doubts. We all have doubts. I think it's part of who we are. It's part of being human. Actually, a lot of Gallup polls say that even among Christians, that only 31% believe that the Bible is actually true. So I don't think having doubts is a, is a bad thing. But this is a gift that has been given to you today that you have to understand is yours. And you have to understand it is true. And you have to accept the resurrection and its promises. You know, having doubt, having concerns, not knowing if it's true isn't anything new. Jesus had to confront that all the time. In Mark 4, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, Jesus and several fishermen, his disciples, remember they were fishermen, went out on the water, and, and Jesus finds himself sleeping in the stern of the boat. And the disciples are getting kind of anxious because the waves are kind of picking up, the boat's getting tossed and turned. And you know, I always read this passage, every time I read it, I think, man, what would make this passage perfect is if Jesus woke up and found all the disciples curled up beside him sleeping. Because they were with Jesus. They were with Jesus Christ. You, you'd think that would give them peace and would give them comfort, but it's not. They're afraid. And so they go to wake Jesus up. You know, they're shaking him out of the boat and saying, Hey, what's going on? What are you going to do? Aren't you worried? We're, we're going to perish here. We're up here dying, and you're sitting here sleeping. And in the 40th verse, the first of that chapter in Mark, Jesus says, why are you so afraid? And he says, do you still have no faith? If you stick with me, if you can change that around, Jesus is basically saying, do you not believe what I'm telling you is true? You need to believe. In Mark 14, we see Peter walking on water. Peter's been with Jesus. And yes, he has a little success. We know that story when he steps out on the boat, out of the boat. But then the worries and the fears and the doubts creep in. He's been with Jesus. And yet still, in verse 31, Jesus says, you have little faith. But he says, why do you doubt? He's saying again the same thing. Why don't you believe what I'm telling you? I mean, even in the Gospel of Matthew, right after we read the resurrection, we know Jesus appears to them in verse, 20, or in verse 17 of chapter 28. Jesus appears to them on the mountain, and it says, When he saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I mean, here's the resurrected Savior, and they're still wondering if this is true. You know, the disciples doubted when they even had Jesus there in the flesh and the person. So what changed for the disciples? The Holy Spirit. That changed for them. We learn in Acts 2 that the disciples were together locked in a room, not carrying out the Great Commission, not taking care of the sick and the widows, not spreading the Word of God, not doing what they've been taught to do. And then the Holy Spirit descends upon them. And they're permanently transformed. Their lives are never going to be the same. And now the disciples are unafraid. And they're empowered to go out and do what Jesus calls them to do. You know what I like to see in that moment right after the Holy Spirit hits them in that room. After all they experienced. It's not till that moment. It's not till that moment. That the disciples said for themselves, it is true. And they believed it.
now that they've been equipped with this power from the Holy Spirit, they're out. They're out preaching the word. They're doing it boldly. They're not afraid of what the government's going to do. They're out doing what Christ taught them to do. They're out healing the sick. They're out spreading the word about the kingdom of God, telling it from their doorsteps, helping it spread to the ends of the earth. They were intentional, and they moved with excellence. Now, how can you know that it's true? It's true for us because we have the Word of God. And it is the truth. And we have the Holy Spirit when we walk through the waters of baptism, accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We have received that same gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Word of God isn't just a bunch of stories or fables or good advice. Or strange, unbelievable acts. It's true. Jesus tells us, if you hold on to my teachings, you are really my disciples. And if we do, then we will know the truth. If we read the Bible and have that, accept that word of what we are told, we know that that will be the truth that sets us free. You're not free if you don't believe it's true. Today, I want to share with you two guarantees, two promises that you have with life in Jesus Christ, that you have in a life with a risen Savior. Two guarantees if you believe it's true. First guarantee is that you're saved from death. And the second is that we're saved from our sinfulness for God's glory and for others here and now, today. I want to talk about those two. What does it mean to be saved from death? You know, Paul teaches us in Romans that all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God, and our penalty for that sin is death. Yet Paul tells us in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now without Christ, we're going to spend an eternity in hell as payment for our sins. You know, death in Scripture is, talks about a, a separation. Everyone's going to die. But some will be able to be in heaven with our Lord for eternity, while others are not. You know, this verse teaches us that eternal life is through Jesus Christ. This is his substitutionary atonement. That's a fancy phrase for basically saying Jesus died in our place when he was crucified on the cross. Because the truth is, we shouldn't be the ones being crucified on the cross. We are the ones that sin and leave sin, live sinful lives. Christ was willing to take that punishment on himself. He substituted himself for us and took the punishment we rightly deserved. It says in 2 Corinthians, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Of course, you know one of the most famous verses of Scripture. And you get the bonus, it's up on the screen. I made them in the earlier service have to just do it without seeing it. John 3, 16. You know that, right? Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God didn't send his son to give you a good example on how to live your life. But he does. God didn't send his son to teach you through useful parables. He did. God didn't send his son to be a great speaker about the kingdom of God, but he was. God didn't send his son to heal the sick and to help the poor, but he did. God didn't send his son to be just another prophet. God sent his son to die for you for your sins, for the sins that you commit so that you can have eternal life. Let 
Make the first service say hallelujah. You don't get an amen hallelujah out of that and say, where's my pastor's time? What are we, what are we, what are we doing? Are we taking it for granted? God sent his son to die for you. That's an amen hallelujah. But you know, if the only thing you believe about today is that this gift is the gift of eternal life when we die, then you're settling for half a dozen. The gift of the resurrection is more than just eternal life when we die. Remember I said there were two things, two promises. We're saved from death. We have eternal life. The second is that we are saved from our sinfulness today. We're saved from our sinfulness today. I'm going to walk away and I'm it. For God's glory and to serve and love others. You know, if you believe that it's true, then you have to live as someone that believes that it's true. You've got to live as someone that believes the resurrection is true. You've got to live as someone that believes Jesus Christ died for you so that your life may be different. So that your life reflects God's glory and reflects a love and a passion for others. The work of Christ on the cross, this resurrection we celebrate today, is redeeming for your life right now. You know, if you've confessed faith in Jesus Christ, if you've been baptized, you've received the Holy Spirit, and you have been equipped for something more. You know, that something more is always ahead of us. It's not something we can reach. We can't graduate from it. We have been saved for something more. Wherever we are in our faith, we walk right now. There's more that God has in store for you than wants for you. You have to live as someone that believes this is all true. Jesus told us in the Gospel of John, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. John again, he said, I've given you an example that as I have done, so you should do. In Matthew, he tells us, but I say you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Paul tells us, be imitators of me just as I am in Christ. That's what we have to be doing. What are we to be doing today, here and now? We need to acknowledge our sin and seek God's forgiveness. We're sinners. Amen? Amen? We're sinners. We are. You know, besides saying it on Sunday morning, do you forgive others as God has forgiven you? We all sin. But we need to recognize that sin and be thankful that we have a Savior that was willing to come and die for us so that sin isn't stuck on us, so that sin doesn't hold us down, so that sin doesn't limit us here and now today because we can escape whatever sin that is on that has got us because of that sin because of Jesus Christ that sin doesn't have to limit us but Jesus Christ frees us to truly live as God intends us to we have to believe it's true we need to set aside time for prayer how much time do you spend in prayer each week? I mean, how much time do you spend each week talking to God? I want to challenge you this week to get a piece of paper, get a journal, and write down how many times you pray. Because what I want to challenge you is to wonder if you think you pray more than you actually do. You know, sometimes we say, oh yes, I pray, oh yes, I read my Bible. But you know, sometimes when we take a look and really reflect on how much we do, we might be surprised. We need to be in regular communication with God. We need to read, study, and be discussion, discussing the Word of God with others. How can you do what Christ has called you to do if you're not reading His Word? If you're not studying that Word, you're not talking about it with others and accepting it as part of who you are and bringing it into your life so that you can live as a person that believes it's true. Again, I'm, I challenge you to look at how often do you read your Bible. And if we do that for confessing our sins, if we spend time in the Word believing it's true, then we have to live out God's Word. 
Jesus told us the greatest commandment. You know it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. How are you living that out? How do you live that out each and every day? Do you give God more than just one day a week? How are you serving your neighbor? Because the truth is, with this resurrection, you have been saved from a life of sin, and a life of sin is focused on self. My needs, my wants. And you have been called from that sin to do greater works that Jesus Christ has called you to. You know, when you accept the truth of the gospel, your love of God and neighbor has to be so far above self. Now, I'm not saying that our works earn us anything. Our works don't earn us salvation. We can't buy it. We're not saved by our works. But our works flourish because we are saved. If you believe it's true, who are you telling about? Whose lives are you helping to transform? What kind of fruit are you producing? You know, we sell the gospel short. We sell the gospel short. If our salvation doesn't strengthen our love of God and love of neighbor, and it's not seen by those around us here and now. If you believe that it's true, then you need to act. That's the question I have. Does your life reflect that you believe the reality that the resurrection is true? Are you focused on serving those around you, do you practice forgiveness? Are you caring for widows and orphans? Are you stretching yourself to love your neighbors around King's Highway and around the world? Are you praying for ways that this family of faith can extend its reach of the gospel? And I would we live as a resurrected people, then we must not live for what we want, but for what God wants. God wants us to love Him and serve those around us. And if we're not reflecting that real life example that Jesus gave us on how to love God and how to serve those around us, then we are settling for a watered down gospel. God wants us to live as Jesus has intended us. As he gave us an example. We have to believe that it's really true. Remember Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, then you are my disciples. If you hold to your own ideas, thoughts, desires, wants, then whose are you? It's a choice you have to make. You need to be his disciple, we can be something else. God the Father, the Sustainer, the Creator sent Jesus Christ the Messiah so that you will not perish but have eternal life. Our God rose Jesus from the grave on Easter so that you may spend eternity with Him and you can live the life that He's called you to. Do you believe it's true? God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that the sin of this world did not hold him down. The sin of this world that put him in the grave did not win. 
because you raised him up so that we may truly see your glory, so that we may understand how much you love us, and so that we may live the lives that you called us to live. Lord, we ask that you would bless us, that you'd help us to accept this truth so that we can truly live as resurrection people.